Welcome to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen, where we help you navigate the challenges of feeding your family and learn about the role food plays in our health and relationships. Feeding and food relationships can be stressful, confusing, and even destructive. I'm Kristen Saxena, a pediatrician and mother of four who's been researching and sharing what I've learned about feeding for over 10 years. In this podcast, I'll share my experience and expertise to help our kids and ourselves with everyday survival tips for real parents. This podcast is about progress, not perfection. So let's get started. Welcome back to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen. I'm your host, Kristen Saxena. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about obesity and bariatric surgery. As you know, obesity is an epidemic in our country, and it's affecting an increasing amount of children, adolescents, and adults. At this point, over a third of all adults being classified by the CDC as obese. Bariatric surgery has become increasingly popular and safe over the last 10 years and is considered by many to be a good option for some people for sustained weight loss. On our show today, guest Stephanie Krivolovic joins us to talk to us about her lifelong struggles with her weight as well as her experience with the gastric sleeve bariatric procedure. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Steph. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about today. Me too. So Steph is actually my cousin. So we go way back, like all the way to my beginning. Uh, You're a a couple years older than me, not much. So, and we lived near each other growing up. And so saw you pretty frequently as I was growing up. You know, all the weirds that everyone, you know, when someone's in your family, they understand right. all the weirds that you grew up with. That's right. All the good, all the weirds. <laughs> all good. <laughs> but for those people, those of our listeners that maybe don't know you so well, can you just uh-huh. give us a little information about you? Yeah. So um, I'm Stephanie Krivolovic. I um, went from Schlotman to Krivolovic, which thought I was going to end up with a Smith or a Jones, but those weren't around, I guess. Yeah, you so, sound like um, the only longer name. Longer possible. name possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been uh, a massage therapist for 21 years, and I've been an esthetician for um, eight years now, and met my husband in 2009 and got married and moved to a small town called Wilbur, Nebraska um, in 2010. Then we started our family right away, um, kind of a little bit quicker than what we thought we were going to, but (laughs) that's okay. Um, So we had our daughter, Catherine, um, and she is now 10. And then we have Jack, who will be five in November. And in all of that chaos and mayhem, I also started opening, um, I I do a day spa with the massage and aesthetics. And then I included um, a size inclusive women's apparel boutique um, because I've always been bigger my whole life. And I and I felt there was a need anytime I would go with my friends to boutiques that there was never like the largest size was like a large or an extra large. And so um, I wanted to have that experience for people that needed that additional sizing to be able to go find someplace and, and have fun and shop and find the cute fun clothes. So we're doing that. And we just opened up our second location um, this summer or no, this um beginning of this year, I guess, 2021. It's been a little crazy lately. Right? So, well, first of all, that's amazing. I can say firsthand that um, you're one of the greatest massage therapists that probably Mm. exists. I might be a little biased, but it's legit. All right. (laughs) But regardless, I mean, I think the point is, obviously, you are a very busy mom. Yes. And so I think a lot of us out there can relate. Um, You know, you're a businesswoman, entrepreneur, and have two kids. Yeah. Also, um, like your husband, you guys have a farm. So throw yes. that in there too. In addition, yes, he farms and I also am a county commissioner. Right. So for Sling that. County. Right. So. I, I forget about that. Just throw that. Just one more thing. Public officer. Yes. Okay. So, so busy lady. Busy. Very busy. So, and we, you know, obviously, like I said, we've known each other for a long, long time. And uh-huh. I feel like we've talked about this a little bit, but never probably really in depth. So you kind of alluded to this before, but as you said, kind of for years, you said that you've sort of struggled with your weight. Yes, I have 
I have always been, um, I would say on the scale, I've always been obese uh, from very young. And it was um, a huge factor in my life growing up. Um, I remember being put on my first diet when I was 10 Mm -hmm. um, and realizing that that was um, a very, um, like it just made me very aware of I am not like the rest of the people, especially in my family. Um, and it's something that I need to keep an eye on because um, it's not it's not appropriate and it's not acceptable. Mm-hmm. And that's just and that was just how it was presented and how it was um, uh, also just I mean, like, that's just kind of the way it is anyway, with any kind of overweight Mm -hmm. people it's like that's really not acceptable so you should probably be doing something about it um in fact i remember i just found a paper that i had made for school in second grade and it said everything that you are um thankful for And so, of course, you do the, I'm thankful for the trees, and I'm thankful for my parents. And then I put on there, I'm thankful for fruit because it makes us skinny. And I just found that last week, and I thought, holy cow, like, that is, that was my mindset from that age on. And so, it was, it's always been a struggle. Um, I lost um, I would say when I would, when I graduated high school, I was probably almost 250 pounds. Um, and then I lost weight and then I would gain back and I would do that. And when I say I lost weight, like I would lose 50, 60 pounds and then I would gain 70, 80 pounds. And then I would lose 60, 70 pounds. And then I would gain 80, a hundred pounds. And that was, I know for my heart, it's just not healthy. Um, my friends always joke, my best friend and I always joke, um, like I was the healthiest fat person because I would go and run. I would work out. I made sure all of my labs, all of my blood work and everything was super healthy. Nothing was ever wrong. And so it's kind of like, well, at some point in time, though, this will take a toll. Mm -hmm. on me and on my body Mm -hmm. so so yeah so kind of going back then I mean I think that the things that you're saying like especially um just when you look back and you see at such an early age even how that impacted you um can you talk to us a little bit more about just like your experience as a child and because I think like even now with my kids like I can you hear the things that they say and the things that they say about themselves and you already see just that messaging um, coming in. And so I think it's just so, and even like, I think there's the direct messaging that maybe, sorry, you receive from your family or from people around you. But I think that Mm -hmm. there's also sort of that indirect messaging. Like you said, like, this isn't acceptable. Is it that somebody says, you know, this isn't acceptable or is that just that's the sort of unsaid message that you received. Mm-hmm. It was just always a very important part, I feel like, of um, that um, that side of the family of you just, it, it's, it's just healthier. And there's that level of, um, um, what do I want to say? Just the outside of people looking in. Like you're, it's just more presentable. You look like you're more put together if you, if you can be at a certain weight and a certain size and, and all of that. So there was a little bit of that, of where it, it was an unspoken, like, oh, okay, this is how we're supposed to look and be. Um, There is also the spoken of um, that kids obviously other kids in school and stuff make notice of it and um, can make fun of it. Um, But really um, that wasn't as bad as, as what it was in, in our home Mm -hmm. of just making sure that you're eating healthy, because if you don't eat healthy, this is just going to cause a problem later on. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And when you're, and it's like anything, if you're told not to do it, then by George, that's the only thing you want to do. Um, and so I, um, I mean, I remember going over to friends' houses that had like, because we didn't have any junk food in our house. So like I would go over and if they had like ho-hos or whatever, and I was like, what do you mean? You just going to have some? And they're like, yeah, help yourself. And I was like, oh my gosh, I get to have this. This is amazing. So it was that, it was just such a Mm -hmm. yo-yo. It was never talked about in a, I feel like not in a not healthy way. I just feel like and people still don't know how to talk about it, especially to kids, because you yeah. don't want to set it off as like a trigger of you need to watch what you're eating or you need to do this or that, because then it's it's um, it's making them aware of it where maybe they weren't aware of it. And it can and it really can go either way. Yeah, it could go. We're like, oh, OK, then I guess I'll I'll go. I'll go ahead and have the vegetables and fruit instead of the cookie or it's oh, my gosh then I'm just going to go ahead and have the cookie because that makes me feel better. And a lot of that is too. Like I grew up in a family that has divorced parents. They were separated in, when I was in second grade, got back together, divorced later. That stress, I dealt with my stress by eating. And mm-hmm. so that there just, there wasn't a lot of, um, healthy or way to deal with how to handle stress period. And so that's, that's how I ended up dealing with all my stress. Totally. Well, I think you brought up so many good points and like, for one, I feel like, um, you know, growing up in sort of the same family, I mean the Uh same extended family, Uh um, a lot of this speaks to me. And I feel like, um, although my, I, I was never overweight or obese, still the things that you say, like, I always feel like I was very focused on food and worried yes. about food and, you know, interested in being healthy. Um, yes. I think sometimes it was legitimate health yes. concerns, but other times as I look back, you know, it was kind of really a more pathologic way I yes. was looking at it. Um, so yeah. I think that, you know, that's a pretty actually universal experience or it's a very common yes. experience for a lot of people. Yes. And also what you're saying, like, um, (laughs) your, you know, your family and their approach, it sounds like you, you would think, I mean, when they're talking about that, you need to be healthy and they're worried, I'm assuming they were coming from a good place in the sense that they really truly were concerned to make sure that you were growing up in a way that was healthy. Um, but also like you said, it's, it's so interesting because it's so, it, the way you approach it, it's so difficult. I think every mm-hmm. parent, like I always worry about that. You know, you hear your kids say stuff like my daughter will come up and be like, can I drink this? It has no sugar. And I'm like, oh, red flag. You know what I mean? Because you're like, yeah, because you think I'm like the sugar police. Know? Yes. Yes. And you're six. And so, you know, I'm like, it's fine. You could drink it even if it had a little, you know what I mean? Like I'm already like, yes. oh God, what's happening? Yes. So it's just so hard. It's so difficult. It's so, um, it's stressful being a parent, mm-hmm. especially of daughters, I feel. Mm-hmm. And, and that's because that was my struggle um, in looking at my daughter and allowing her to feel comfortable and make decisions mm-hmm. and know that um, I can go ahead and try to have healthy options there and explain the reasons why, you know, I've always, I've always, um, I didn't understand. I should say that until I was later on in life where it was like, your body is like a machine and you need the fuel. And so if you don't put appropriate fuel in your car, it's not going to run right. And that's the way that we need to look at food in order to have, um, a healthy body instead of that sugar, it's not good for you because sugar's tasty and it makes you have energy. And if I want to have energy, then absolutely. That's what I need to do right now. Or, you know, those kinds of things, but then trying to express that to a child and get them healthy eating habits is beyond the hardest thing I've had to do as a parent. Totally. And we've talked about this before on the podcast, but so much of 
our concerns for our kids are really just reflecting our own anxieties about (laughs) our own, you know, what we've been told or our own. Right. So it's like, uh, maybe I'm overly concerned with sugar or being overweight or health. And like, I, you see yourself like imposing, imposing that Uh on your kids. Um, Uh and it's not really about, you know, that cookie today is not, it's irrelevant. It is irrelevant. Um, but it becomes this like huge deal to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're taking your your experiences and you're like, I don't ever want my child to feel that way. Mm-hmm. And really, it's like, OK, but who's to say that they will feel that way if they have that same experience? Every single person will have a different feeling upon that. So that's that's been a very uh, that's been a huge struggle, um, especially since since she was born, like if, um, well, and we can talk about this later, but just on why I decided to do the surgery. Um, but just her seeing me balloon up, lose a lot of weight again, Mm -hmm. working out, eating healthy, but doing drastic diets. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have done very, very drastic diets and that's how come I realized like, I want to do the surgery because I can't I don't want, I don't want her to think that this is a normal cycle Mm -hmm. of life. And then two, um, as much as, as parents and as mothers, we're supposed to be like, you should love your body and everything that you're in it and all this kind of, you know, like wonderful empowerment. It's really hard when then you're in your bathroom going, nothing fits. I feel horrible. I look awful. And your whole mindset changes. And and I thought, I don't want her to be raised in that. I don't want mm-hmm. her to see her mom struggle when when there are options out there to fix it. Yeah. So then let's fix it. Well, yeah. So that, I mean, that brings up so many questions I have. So let's go ahead and chat about that. So last year, you mm-hmm. went ahead yeah. and you went, underwent a, a gastric sleeve procedure. Yes. So can you walk us through number one, your decision to make, to do this? So, um, after, yeah. And it's going to go back a little bit. And so, and I'll try to tell the story. (laughs) Okay. So after I had Catherine, um, we had trouble getting pregnant, maintaining pregnancies. Um, and so I kept on having miscarriages and I was, um, at that point in time, probably 275 pounds. So, um, after them being on Clomid and injections for all of the alls to try, um, and it, you're a little hormonal anyway, and then you add um, weight on top of that, it just, it was too much. And so I finally said to Tim, after about uh, two years of really trying, we had like five miscarriages in that two years. And I said, I'm done. Mm-hmm. I just need to take a break. Um, our cousin's stepdaughter was getting married in Jamaica. And I was like, this would be a wonderful time for me to focus and like lose weight so I can look good to go to Jamaica because, you know, you can't go to Jamaica not looking good. So right. that was my, <laughs> right. I mean, like, he's just so like, Oh, oh I got it. If I, yeah, not, not has nothing to do with like celebrating a wedding has everything to do with me and my thought process of, you know, you, you, need to go Mm -hmm. and and there is that part of not wanting to be a disappointment to the family Mm -hmm. and to your friends you know like oh you have to you know you're being that person that is um overly obese or extremely obese where they are the ones like which one of these things just doesn't belong and it's it's that although that's not what your friends and family are thinking that is how i um, I felt, or I, um, felt like you guys should feel so (laughs) putting feelings upon people that they don't need to have. Um, anyway, so I did some extreme diets. Um, I did one where it was 500 calories a day and I wasn't supposed to work out during that time frame, but I would work out, um, about, um, an hour to an hour and a half each day. Um, and, uh, lost about, uh, well, 95 pounds. Wow. And so got down, went to, um, the, went to Jamaica 
and um, was able to have a great time. And as soon as we got there, though, they have buffets. And I was like, I did my diet and I totally restricted in order to get to this point. So I'm going to eat everything. And I haven't had anything to drink. Like I haven't had any alcohol and they have cocktails in the morning and you're on vacation. So of course you can have a Bailey's with your coffee in the morning or a Bloody Mary or both. So like (laughs) then it just, it kind of spiraled a little bit. Um, And again, uh, figured out that, okay, came back. We started trying again right after that. Nothing was happening. I started slowly creeping on the weight again because I wasn't sticking to a 500 calorie (laughs) diet. Um, And then um, decided that um, after a year of of trying to get pregnant and nothing happening, I just said to my husband, like, okay, we've got two months. I'm not going to be on any more Clomed. I'm not going to do anything. It's too much. Um, and then I got pregnant with Jack. Of course. On that second month. <laughs> yes. With nothing. And I was like, okay, so here we go. So went through that pregnancy. Um, after that pregnancy, postpartum was very difficult for me with Catherine, but I didn't really know that that's what it was. Um, In with sense Jack, of like emotionally um, or like psychologically. Yes. Yeah. Like a yes. depression or blues. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Then with Jack, and as I have gotten older, my anxiety, I have felt has gotten worse. I have gone to the local, my local family care doctor, PA actually, and said, I'm really, my anxiety is getting out of control. He said that I just like to be in control of things and need to learn how to let go. Okay. I don't see him anymore. Um, and then, um, well, you know, it's all about finding the right people. If it doesn't it serve you, absolutely. time to move on. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, my After Jack was born, then I was like not even sleeping. My anxiety was just so heightened. Um, and then I was also opening up a new location. And I was doing like I was just trying to keep myself so busy that I wouldn't have to think about my mental health, that then the only way that I handled any kind of stress was then just I ate Mm -hmm. because I wasn't dealing with my mental health. Um, In October of 2019, August of 2019, um, somewhere around there, um, that summer I found a psychiatrist and I, and I, that was recommended. I said, I need to find someone and I need to find something. Um, I went in and I said, I really need to get my anxiety under control. She's like, okay, great. And what else? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, um, well, I mean, I've always struggled with my weight, but I've always struggled with my weight. Well, do you binge eat? And I'm like, no, no, I don't do that. And then I looked at her and I go, well, what's binge eating? Because I thought like binge eating was just like if you were like bulimic and then you binged. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, I didn't know the terminology. So she, I want you to fill out this form. Okay. And everything. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm a binge eater. Like that's a thing. Like this is an actual thing. Like it's not just me not having willpower. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a thing. And she goes, yeah, she goes, and um, I'm going to go ahead and give you another form too. And I'm clicking that thing off. She's like, you do, do you know you have ADD, ADHD? And I said, oh yeah. In second grade, I was diagnosed with that, but they just said that I would probably outgrow it. And then I just had to have like folders and stuff on either side of my desk. And she's like, have you struggled with it? I was like, well, yeah, but I just figured like, that's, this is as good as it gets. I mean, like, okay. And so we started working on medications to help with my ADHD in my binge eating and my anxiety. And I started going to counseling weekly Mm -hmm. and after starting to deal with the reasons why I'm binging and getting medication to help with my anxiety and all of that, that's when I realized, okay, I really want to do something about my weight. And now I feel like I have the tools to do that. So let's, Let's make this a permanent solution. 
So a friend of mine had had gastric sleep in Lincoln that year. Um, so this was probably about nine, 10 months after her surgery. And I just said to her, I want to sit down. I want to talk to you about it. And she goes, great. I've been waiting for you to ask me. <laughs> um, I started looking into it. Our insurance didn't cover it. So, um, and she's a nurse, she's an OR nurse. And she was like, you will not go to Mexico. Cause we have, I know several people that will go there. Um, and my husband actually, Tim found, um, the surgery suite in Las Vegas, that this is all that they do. And if you, your insurance doesn't cover it, you just pay a flat rate out of pocket. They take care of the hotel. They take care of the, all of the pre-op um, stuff and you go and you have your surgery and a week later you're home. And so, and that was in November and that it sounds like it was kind of like boutique fancy, right? Oh God, you told was, us a little bit about this. It was the best like, vacation I've ever been on. <laughs> it's the it only was. vacation where you leave and you're like, are losing weight. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was the only vacation where you're like, I feel like crap 24 hours after surgery. But before that, it was awesome. They they have a hotel for you. They pick you up from the airport. Um, we ended up, I took my friend that had had the surgery and that she's a nurse because um, you stay, they have you all outpatient um, and you need to have someone there with you in the middle of the night to get you up and stuff like that. And I also knew that my husband's just not a very good nurse. So I was like, I'm going to take her with just in case. Um, and because she had already experienced all of it, she would, you know, she's like, this is what you need to do. Like you need, because that post-surgery is so painful because you have, they blow you up with the air and the gas and stuff. And so you have to walk around and you have to have like someone pound on your back. And, and that is, that was the only painful part of this post-surgery that I have experienced. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that some people have some issues with eating and not being able to eat things. Um, but I have not, I know I can't eat things, but it's pretty much like it's, it's fine. We're finding out, we're still finding out what I can and can't do. Sure. Well, kind mm -hmm. of going back, I mean, you hit on so many points. I know. That I think, no, I mean, it's like a conversation that could go on for days. Right. But mm -hmm. I mean, number one, like the thing where when you really start to focus on your mental health and you start to realize that this is not this is not willpower. Um, yeah, this is it's just so it ends up being so much more complicated and involving so many more aspects of your life. Um, the binge eating disorder, I think, like you said, it's something that's very poorly understood. I think in the general public, um, like I think, like you said, a lot of times we think of like binge as like bulimia and you're like, well, I'm not throwing up in the bathroom. I don't think I have that. Um, but it's actually really, I think it's the most common eating disorder. I would say because it's so hidden. Yeah. I mean, that's just it. When you're, when you're like, oh, the kids are all asleep and I'm get and I get some time to watch some Netflix and mm -hmm. I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to go ahead and have a few cookies mm -hmm. and then a few more cookies and then a few more cookies. And it's okay because nobody can see me. So really I don't have that judgment of how many cookies are you eating? Yeah. Um, you know, when my husband, when I told my husband that I was binge eating, he had no clue. And he was like, I've always, I never see you eat. So that's how come he was always like, I don't know how you work out all the time and you are gaining all of this weight. And it's like, cause I would eat around nobody else. Mm -hmm. So that in of itself, it's such a shameful thing. And really so many people do it. Right. Well, and even like if you read through like the way it's diagnosed, I know a lot of the questions are like, do you feel out of control like when you're eating or eating more? And to be honest, is that abnormal? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm even like, well, yeah, I mean, you have we've to kind all, of like, we've all had those days where we're like, oh, good thing I got stretchy pants on today because that was a good meal. <laughs> right. Like, I am full. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, and again, just those pieces of how it all goes together. And, you know, I myself also this year, like started seeing a therapist and like on my list of life regrets is only that, like, why didn't I not do this before? Because it's totally, yeah. you know, once you start actually recognizing and focusing on your mental health, yeah. 
Yeah. It's almost like you're living a different life. Like your outlook yeah. on the world is different. Your outlook on yourself and the way that you look at the things you do and start to be like, that's why I do that. Like it all makes sense. And it's still going to be hard for me to change it. But at yeah. least I go, yeah, you yeah. know, so kind of the same sort of things like, like you said, like you're always opening businesses and, and I suppose we share a lot of the same genetics too, because I'm like, I know like one of the reasons I'm constantly busy is because it's, it's like a, it treats your anxiety, right? You're like, well, if I'm yeah. always doing something, yeah. I don't have to yeah, deal with my anxiety. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, and I think that all goes together. And because food is so interwoven into our lives and our psychology, I think the fact that that plays out for people in one way or another in their diet is not surprising. Yes. And the fact that, yeah, when you're not dealing with your mental health, you will have to, people will deal with it. It's some, either some people mm -hmm. run, some people drink, some people like whatever that is, yep. because mentally you have to be able to do something with it mm -hmm. or, or some people just crawl into bed and they're like, I'm done. Yeah. I, I don't want to do, I don't want to do anymore. And so it is, it's just one more, it was one more avenue that I didn't realize that is how I was coping with everything that I was dealing with mentally. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Just the, the brain, the brain protects itself and it will do it uh -huh. in ways that sometimes don't really serve us in the long run. No. <laughs> no. So I did want to talk to you a little bit about, um, you kind of had talked about this and so your decision to make, to go ahead with the, um, bariatric surgery, uh, how was this, was this a decision you kind of made on your own or with your family? I mean, how did you approach this with your family and what was sort of the response? Yep. So, um, I've had, I've always thought about doing the surgery for years. Um, in fact, I talked to your husband one Christmas about like, tell me what's all out there anymore. Uh -huh. Um, and just in the back of my head thinking like that would be this magic pill or this magic, something magical is going to happen. <laughs> um, but when my girlfriend had had it done um, and with her being in the OR for the last 20 some odd years and seeing what was working and what people were coming, maybe even back because of post-operative issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know for a while um, the um, bypass was very popular or a room why in reading. And then I, and then I just started deep diving and reading and how the long-term effects of that there had, they aren't as successful as the sleep. And the reasons why the sleep is so much more successful, that they're taking a portion of that stomach that has the hormone in it, that makes you mm -hmm. feel hungry, the that they're removing mm -hmm. that and in that, that in of itself is a long-term, um, just better results. People are having longer term results with it. And, and, and when I say results on just not then going back and gaining the weight back mm -hmm. that they had had the surgery for originally, um, the fact that they do leave more of that stomach, you're not having to deal with so much of concerns of like, um, not getting enough nutrition. Mm -hmm. And, and so well, and that, I think an important distinction too is in pre, in kind of older versions or some of the more the ones that were more popular previously, they were removing portions of the intestine, and yeah. that was also contributing to people not absorbing nutrients appropriately, and you know having right. this small stomach where they're trying to get food in and not not getting adequate protein, adequate nutrition, um, yes. because their intestines are no longer absorbing the way that they used to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I had read all of that and that there wasn't, I mean, sure. Then you have to be on a multivitamin for the rest of your life. Okay. <laughs> I mean, who really isn't on a multivitamin, <laughs> um, already. So fine. Um, so I sat down with my husband and I told him mm -hmm. and he, um, he was just like, yep. Yeah. He is so supportive on anything that I do. He's just my number one fan. And that in of itself is amazing. And so when you have that in your life of whatever we need to do to um, help you feel better about you, then mm -hmm. let's do that. 
Um, um, he did, though, put his foot down. He said, you will not go to Mexico. You're not going to do that. <laughs> well, you need somebody looking that. out for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the fact that we were also, it was the middle of a pandemic. Right. I mean, it was 2020. So there were times even I thought, are, are we even going to be able to fly to Vegas to go and have the surgery done? Mm-hmm. Um, the out-of-pocket I did look at Lincoln um, and I contacted them and the out of pocket that I was going to have to pay just for the surgery um, was going to be anywhere from 18 to $20,000. And so that did include the EKG and the, and the, um, they do a little psyche evaluation beforehand, all those kinds of things. And so when we found this other location and it cost $10,000, we're like, okay, Mm -hmm. let's do this. Um, and with him being on board and the fact that he's the one that found it, like once I said, this is the surgery that I want to have done, he got online and started doing research. And so he's the one that came to me with this place in Vegas and said, I really think we should look into this and Mm -hmm. we should contact them and get the information. And so, yeah, he's been completely on board. That has been super helpful. Um, I am an open book. You know that yes. as my being part of my family, <laughs> a lot of people don't feel comfortable telling people that they're having the surgery. So I have had people say to me, well, what do you tell people when they say, oh, wow, you've lost weight or whatever. I tell them flat out, I had surgery. A lot of other people will just say, I'm watching what I'm eating, mm-hmm. which you are. I still have to make sure I'm getting in an appropriate amount of protein every single day and that I'm eating, making right decisions and choices and getting in, um, you know, it's a protein and then it's a vegetable. And then if I'm still hungry, then it can be something else. So some people feel more comfortable saying that. And I, I don't think that there's any, um, anything wrong with not telling people that you sure. had the surgery done or not. But for me, I, I want people to ask me questions. And yeah. so that's how come I'm always like, nope, this is what I did. And if it can help someone else, then fantastic. Right. Well, I think that is it. Just like the authenticity that you have. I mean, it truly is helpful to people because I think that that's part of the image too, is that you, when you, whatever, whatever your insecurities are, whatever your personal struggles that you're dealing with, and it's different for everyone, but I think you look at everybody and you think that everything comes so much easier to them. Mm. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. so I think that it's hard and it's, you know, obviously if people want to keep things to themselves, that's their own prerogative and you do what you need to do to take care of you. But on the flip Mm -hmm. side, I think that you shouldn't overlook the service that you really do to people by being authentic and genuine um, because it does tell people they're like oh you know they look at you and just say like look she's just watching what she eats and she's losing all this weight I mm-hmm. I fail you know I did I tried right. to do the same thing and I couldn't do it so when you're just right. honest about it I think that that just I think we often overlook mm-hmm. what that well, means and to I'm people. very and I'm very honest with it too, that I say, and I'm also on meds mm-hmm. and I also still do counseling. Like I'm still mm-hmm. taking care of like this weight loss. Isn't just because of the surgery. This weight loss is because I'm taking care of my mental health that then in turn can help me take care of my physical health. Absolutely. So you've lost about a hundred pounds to date, right? Yep. So hundred Yep. 100 what? Right out of 100 pounds. I okay, I was going to give you credit for One, it. <laughs> 100.2 pounds. Okay. So, so, <laughs> that, yeah, was that was like breakfast, though. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> right? Um, so I guess my question would be, going through the, the process, what have you learned in the sense, what did you, what has having the surgery and going through the experience done for you that you didn't even realize it would do? And what, did it not do that? I think that maybe like you said, it was, you thought it was going to be this magic, magic Mm -hmm. bullet. So I think it's important, I think for people to understand what it does. And I think it does lots of wonderful things or it seems like it has, but what did it not do (laughs) too? So what it did not do was still fix my mental health. Um, I'm disappointed that I'm only a hundred pounds down. And I say that out loud and I think, that's a ridiculous statement. Mm-hmm. Um, but that mental part of my brain is you probably should have lost more by now. 
or you probably, so it's that constant. It's, it's why I still go to counseling. It's being okay with, um, me because I, I haven't made, I'm not doing the diet perfectly. Mm -hmm. That's life. Um, you know, yep. I had a half of a muffin this morning, a very small muffin, but it's that you're not really supposed to be doing carbs or you're not supposed to be doing this. I wanted to do this. That's such a triggering thing for me that if I have to stick to just a specific, it just, it triggers all of those previous diets that, mm-hmm. I, that I was doing that I'm doing this as moderation mm-hmm. that I can have a little bit of everything. Now, does that mean that I can, um, that I would probably be have that I would have lost more weight to date if I would have just done exactly what the diet was. Sure. But that's not how I'm going to live my life. Yeah. And so I need to be okay with that. Um, in it's still going. It doesn't mean that it stops. Like I hit a hundred pounds and then we're down and then, and then that's it. Now we're done. I'm, I'm still 10 months out. I still have, you know, I, it will probably take another six months before the full effect of the surgery or the finality of not the finality mm-hmm. of the surgery, but like, that's where the majority of your weight loss is going to happen. Right. Hold on. Ha. Um, well, I was just going to say, I think that speaks to a lot of points we talk about all the time. And that relates to a lot of things is just that idea of progress, not perfection, whatever that yeah. is. But like you said, yeah. I mean, that's what's sustainable. That's what real life is. That's what real betterment is, is just making that progress and knowing like I'm going the right direction. Yeah. Per- I mean, yeah. perfection like, isn't sustainable. It's not even real. I don't think <laughs> not real because you never it's feel like that. Real. You know, if you like you said, uh, you know, you're 100 pounds down, your mental health is not fixed. And I think that's the yeah. thing with a lot of these things, whatever it is, is you always think if I could just X, if yeah. I could just be this, then yes. I would be I'd be happy. Yeah. I'd be yeah. I'd be stable. I'd have all my shit together. Right. That's nope. right. That's right. <laughs> Not going to happen. Mm-hmm. It will never happen. Um, and so when I have those thought processes through counseling, I've learned that I can acknowledge like, that's not a really healthy thought. Like, mm-hmm. let's not think that way. Let's look at the benefits, like let's out. So that, um, that has been very helpful in the fact of um, continuing my mental health journey. Yes. And making of like, so that's kind of been a downfall. The other downfall with it is um, no more carbonation, Mm. which isn't that big of a deal. Um, I really wasn't. I used to be a huge pop drinker. Then I stopped. So that was fine. But I really got into like sparkling water. And so I'm like, dang it. I missed that part of it. Um, The other stuff, it's been really it, it just, I've been so lucky that it's been very easy for me to, um, to not have a lot of side effects. That's great. I, I can eat basically whatever there are. Like I said, there's some things that I can't and that's okay. I, it's not like I miss it. Right. Like, I think I miss it until like I take a bite of something and then I'm like, Oh, that doesn't even taste right. So that's been like, that's been weird too. Cause in my head, I'm like, I wouldn't normally want to eat that, but I just have no desire. So, okay, that's fine. But, um, yeah, I've been very lucky on that. That's wonderful. Well, I am mm-hmm. going to move on. So we have a second yeah. segment of our yeah. podcast yeah. each time that we call ask me anything. So I have a couple of questions, um, that really are probably much better questions for you. So this one is from Hannah and it says, I underwent I underwent a gastric sleeve procedure last year. I feel much healthier and have been very happy with my results. However, I have a preteen daughter and worry that my focus on my diet and weight will negatively impact the way she eats and sees herself. How do you approach or talk about body image with your kids? Which I think is hits home mm-hmm. for you and kind of we touched on that. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I don't expect is... you to feel like you have to have all the right answers because it's difficult. Yeah, no. I'm str- Hannah. I'm struggling too, girl. <laughs> um, it, 
with having a 10 year old daughter who is on the healthier side of things and in fourth grade and kids start noticing um I just have been very open and honest with her, though. I have told her my struggles of growing up. I talk to her. I, when she's having struggles, I am, you know, let's let's look at this. Let's think about this. Um, how does it make you know you feel when someone else says that? But more of the fact of, I always just ask her, like, how do you feel? Mm-hmm. Like, do you feel? happy and healthy and you can move and you can go out and ride your bikes and you can you play volleyball and you do all these things so let's focus on what your body can do for you that makes you happy instead of what your what someone might think your body looks like Mm -hmm. and so that's and that's been really that's what we've been struggling with just in this last year and especially with my surgery she um before i left she was concerned she wouldn't recognize me when i came home i was like nope it doesn't come off that fast i wish it did that doesn't happen um but then there has been times that she has said to me like at the very beginning she said you know i thought you would look thinner by now or those and and it's it and i but it gives me that opportunity and i'm like thanks for bringing that up let's talk about that what is that what does that mean for you in and, and again because i'm in counseling then that helps me kind of use the verbiage or at least acknowledge those feelings and say you know this is what this is where the steps are at and it's not going to be an overnight process mm-hmm. just like we're making changes to eat healthier overall in our family like this is this is just one step at a time and we can only do one you know that's it's not perfection it's just progress yeah well i love a lot of what you said and again i don't i don't know that there's a right answer to that because if there uh-huh. was i mean i think we wouldn't all be like dying every day wondering what we're supposed to say to our kids and I think especially as women with daughters I think that's the easiest for us to relate to and I think you start to see the things that your child's struggling with you start to think about your own childhood you start to think about Uh kids are mean and it Uh just becomes you know this sort of like you want to protect them from that and at the same time it's sort of like you don't want to be the one giving them a complex about things and so it's just so hard but I love what you said and I think that the biggest part that we can learn from our own experience and maybe we arrived a little late at it is to focus really on the mental health, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more like do your best to, to focus on that. Let's keep you psychologically and mentally in the best place that we can be honest. Um, and because no matter what, you know, whatever it is, weight or whatever challenges and insecurities, they're going to have them. Yeah. But the more that we can like build them up, emotionally psychologically i think they're going to be able to you hope they're going to have the tools to handle better um in a healthier more constructive way whatever whatever their personal struggles are so i love that and if you do figure it out let me know (laughs) yeah absolutely i have one more question this is from valerie she says i'm in my early 20s and considering bariatric surgery my doctor says i could be a good candidate but my family particularly my mother and sister are not supportive they seem to look at it as cosmetic surgery and say i do not need it they tell me i should be able to be healthier with diet and exercise and shouldn't worry so much about how i look i feel like i've tried and failed at every diet I admit that a big reason I want the surgery is that I don't like the way I look, but I also think it's better for my health in the long run. What should I do? That's a long one. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, again, I go back to the mental health. Mm -hmm. It's what, what is going to make, this is your decision. This is something for you that you need to live with for the rest of your life. This doesn't matter what, um, how another person, person feels like you should be handling your life. And that's a huge, um, that was a huge acknowledgement even for me. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about Mm -hmm. me. It really doesn't. Uh, And we can say that all day long. And that's really hard. Like we all still struggle every single day with that. But in the long run, I have to be able to lay down at night and I'm the only one that's in that head going, okay, what, you know, 
Yeah. We're doing okay today. Today's a good day. And I feel really good about myself or this is what I did. And, and so, you know, Valerie, I would say that's, that's going to be a difficult decision for you to make. But if, if you can step outside of it and look at it from um, what would be the best thing for you, that's going to make, that's going to be the thing that makes your decision. Yeah. Not what someone else is saying. I think, I mean, I think you're exactly right. I mean, if she's working with her own doctor and feels health wise that this is a good decision. um, And then I think again, like it wasn't really touched on here, but I think you made the huge point is to make sure, are you, are you caring for your mental health? Are you in a good place for this right now? Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think that is the other thing to keep in mind is like this, although I think it means a lot to people and maybe a lot of people outwardly think that, you know, this is generally more of a cosmetic thing. The thing with bariatric surgery, I think particularly at this point, is it really has been shown to to offer people sustained weight loss, probably more than any other intervention oh, that I've seen. Absolutely. And and that it has, I mean, if you look through the literature, it really has been related to reducing either reducing risk for or actually eliminating um, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol for people. So legitimately health benefits are documented. Um, But like you said, and maybe the thing for Valerie to keep in mind is it isn't, it isn't this magic bullet. If you haven't cared for your mental health and if that is the piece that you're most searching for, this, this may not be the, right. This might There's, not be the answer to all of your problems. Right. And I always look at it that way. Mm-hmm. My, dis, the decision for surgery and with any, I feel like any kind of medical is they're all tools. Mm-hmm. If you're on medication for anything, it is, you can be on medication for um, high blood pressure. You still have to watch what you're eating and to keep, I mean, there's so much, there's so much more to it. It's not going to fix it. It's just one aspect of it that then can help and and it's a great tool, but you have to be able to utilize the other things that make that, that make it work. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Steph. This was an excellent conversation. Like I said, I feel like I could talk for days about it, but I really appreciate you sharing all this information with all of us. Yeah, I'm, I was very excited. So I'm, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you. This is great. I'm loving the podcast. By thank the way. you. Thank you so much. Well, yeah. on that note, uh, yeah. thanks again to all our listeners for joining us for another good episode. If you're enjoying our podcast, please hit that subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review and leave us some comments about what you'd like to see on our future shows. And we'll see you next week. Bye.